What's happening, everybody? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 778, with today's guest, Sensei Daniel Sands. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I founded Whistlekick because I love traditional martial arts and I wanted more and better. And that's what we do here. Everything we do here at Whistlekick is more and better for you, the traditional martial artist and the traditional martial arts community as a whole. I love what this community is globally, locally, and I'm investing everything I have and everything I am into supporting it because it means that much to me. Now, if you want to see all the things that we're doing in support of you, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. It's the place we've got all of our stuff linked or available. And there's stuff over there like our free flexibility program, literally free, just completely free. If you buy something over there, you can use the code podcast15 to save 15% on apparel or protective equipment or training programs. There's a lot over there. We also run events. So go check out whistlekick.com. I think you'll be surprised at the full extent of everything that we do. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio is a place to go if you want to get more, go deeper on this show. Every episode we've ever done is available. You can sign up for a newsletter over there. You can tip us if you want to do that via PayPal. But go check it out. It's where you're going to get the full show notes. You can search stuff. There, there's a, a lot of great stuff over there. Now, if you want to support the work that we do for the show and for the company in general, there are so many things you can do to help us out. You can follow us on social media and get even more stuff for free at Whistlekick everywhere you might think of. You could also tell friends about the show, maybe share this episode. Hey, you got to check out this episode. This was a great conversation. It reminded me of you or uh, you've been talking about this same challenge that you're having. This person had some insight in it. You can also join our Patreon, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick starts at two bucks a month. And we're going to give you behind the scenes stuff. We're going to give you bonus episodes. We're going to give you access to book drafts, training program drafts, get you in on the school owner's mastermind. Do you want me to train you personally? All of these things and more happen as part of the Patreon. There's a reason like everything else we do, it continues to grow because we deliver overwhelming value to those who are willing to contribute. Now, if you love what we do, maybe you're already in the Patreon, you're saying, Jeremy, what else can I do to help? I love what you guys are doing. Go to the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. It's a not quite secret page. It's not linked in the navigation. We want you to type it in. We're not going to make it too easy for you because that's where we give you the most authentic, most exclusive behind the scenes stuff, as well as a complete list of all the ways you can help support the mission because we are all in this together. We are all family. We are all connected. And the more you help, the more we can bring you great episodes and products and events and everything like the things that we already do. So I had a wonderful time talking to Dan in this episode. We we wandered a bit. Not really a surprise, is it? Guests tend to wander. I tend to wander with them. But we talked about a story that I think could have been really different. A story of someone who, through no choice of their own, started over multiple times. And they did it willingly. I talk to people all the time. I don't want to start over. I don't want to start over. I don't want to go back to white belt. I didn't get any sense of that. Dan embraced these changes. And it led to, as we'll hear, some absolutely wonderful stuff and a deeper understanding of his relation to the arts and his training and his technique in a way that I think any of us would be fortunate to experience. Hey, how's how it are going, you? sir? Good. Great. How are you? How are you? I'm, I'm well. Yourself? No complaints. With your, your, your color-coordinated shirt <laughs> and your background? <laughs> I'm so jealous. That's great. Nice stuff. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? Yeah. I'm well. I'm well. I'm, it's cold. I just lit a fire in the stove because you know, I turn off the furnace while we record. And... Oh, I'm jealous. Where, where in the? Where are you? I'm, I'm in Vermont. Oh, Vermont. I'm in Florida. We're in the one state on the map where it's still <laughs> orange. Yeah. It was 80 uh, degrees was the other day. Two, I, w- I was in West Palm two weeks ago. Oh, okay, so you was, know. It was, it was nice to be outside in a t-shirt. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, by the end of winter, we're outside in a t-shirt too, because it's like, oh, 35, 40 degrees. That feels great. But yeah. 
Yeah, there's. I'll, oh, I'll, the... I'll take the winter weather there. It's that it's that summer weather that kills me. Oh, oh, the summer's bad. See, winter's nice because you know, thirties, forties, fifties. It's comfortable. It's not like, oh my god, I'm going to freeze to death. But lately, we're not even getting that. Like, it's supposed to hit maybe the forties this weekend. We'll see. They've been they've mm. been forecasting that. It hasn't really happened yet. What's but... the temperature when the iguanas fall out of the trees? The iguanas usually there. around forties. Forties. Yeah, a little bit fifties. They start slowing down. Forties is when they just can't move and they just start dropping. <laughs> I, I I think that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I just <laughs> I. I you know, we, we don't have anything like that. You know, the closest we get is, I don't know, we've got squirrels throwing acorns at us or something. You know, <laughs> but the idea of having to, to look up because there might be lizards dropping on your head. Yeah, and they'll just be laying everywhere. Uh, but during the summer, you see them by the dozens out on the side of the road every, anyway. So we didn't used to have them about 20 years ago. They don't they weren't around like this, but really? now they're yeah, now they're here. Oh, crazy. Pets, pets that people release. They just bred and this is a good environment for them. And they just took over. Sure. Let's do it. So. Uh, what's on your shirt? Art... Um, my shirt, Art of One Dojo. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And we, what's? Tell me about that. You're wearing oh. that for a reason. You're on this show, so you chose oh. that shirt. <laughs> um, so Art of One. Let's do that. Let's start there. Okay. Well, um, Art of One Dojo is a YouTube project that um, myself and my uh, close friend and partner, um, Zach, uh, Mr. Zach, he's been on the channel a few times. We started this project back in 2018. Um, it was actually kind of a funny story how it started. It originally was a marketing platform. Um, we run a um, small video production company in Florida and we were looking into YouTube marketing and we're like, well, why don't we put, build some sort of a package where we could do a whole bunch of um, series of videos, short videos that we could put together for clients to to market their local business and get them on the search oh, cool. engines. And we're like, okay, cool. So we, you know, we, we planned it out. We had like a whole bunch of topics planned. We're like, well, why don't we go to my instructor and do like a free campaign just to kind of see how it works. <clears throat> and um, we went to him, of course, he was all about it and we did it. And in two different days of shooting, uh, we filmed about 60 videos and they were like one minute, like really quick yeah, one minute videos. Still. Yeah. And um, we kind of felt bad because we just kind of hit him with questions and he just had to just answer off the top of his head. So they're, they're, they're just really quick, rough around the edges, marketing videos. And um, it brought in a little bit, you know, it brought his school a little bit of business. We're like, okay, this is cool. And we were working on doing another series when he announced that he was uh, closing the school and moving to North Carolina. And we're like, oh, hmm. so we stopped it. And um, we actually got busy with other projects. We started working on other campaigns, but never really got back to that. But over the course of a couple of years, we noticed that it was still gaining a little bit of momentum. People were still hmm. subscribing and asking for content. And we're like, well, this is weird. We haven't released anything for a while. And they were just short little bite-sized videos. And Zach's like, well, why don't we do it? Why don't we pick it up again and have you host it? And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, it was one of those things like, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? And um, in 2018, uh, my father passed away and mm, we kind of like stepped back a little bit. I started to restructure and um, I went, I, I had been in and out of the martial arts for a little bit, like not training so hardcore because there's a lot going on. And I'm like, you know, I need to get back to my center, back to my roots. And I thought about the project. I'm like, why don't we actually do this project? And we just kind of threw together some topics. We thought it would be along the lines of parents watching uh, YouTube, like looking for schools for their kids or like researching topics. You know, will my kid get hurt? Will my kid become a bully? That Those seem to be hot topics. And we threw together a handful of videos and we put them up there and they started catching. And But the funny thing was the people watching were not parents. They were actual uh, lifelong martial artists, people who were asking, oh, we could, can you cover this? Can you cover that? And we're like, oh, this yeah. is a very different audience than we thought we'd have. And we just kind of rolled with it. And um, five years later, we're still doing it. We're still putting it together. Nice. And it's been it's been a really fun journey. And um, the one rule with the channel we've always had was we want to focus on the good that the martial arts can do. It doesn't matter the style. It doesn't matter the practitioner. It's all about how can you improve your life through the martial arts, whether it be culturally or for self-defense or you're rehabbing yourself or it's a lifestyle yeah. change or discipline, whatever. There's always good that can be taken from all the arts. And that's kind of what we kind of niched ourselves into. Hmm. Well, we're certainly on the same page on just about everything that that you said there. Longtime listeners know, you know, it's, I don't care what you do, I care that you do it. I care that you exactly. enjoy it. It works for you, and you know, I have no right to tell anybody else that they should train the way that they're training. It's a to me, that's the most arrogant thing you can do. You talked about in and out the martial arts. It's something that I think a lot of us experience. Most of us don't talk about it. You know, it's. Uh, 
you know, the, the, all of the answers are in your training. Well, not, not always. Sometimes there, sometimes there are better <laughs> answers elsewhere. But at some point, you, you not only got started, but became really passionate. So I, I want to talk about those two points in time. Give us a bit about when, where, why you started. And then we'll come back and, and I'll ask you about when starting became something of real importance for you. Okay. Uh, well, my starter story is not that exciting. It's, a, it's like a lot of people uh, growing up watching martial arts films, mainly The Karate Kid and then later Ninja Turtles. So, you know, as a 10 year old, I'm like, oh, I want to I want to learn karate because because 10 years old. Yep. And um, I told my mom one day, I'm like, I would like to learn martial arts. And she's like, oh, oh, OK. And then we ended up moving. We were in Long Island at the time and we moved down here to South Florida. And I guess she'd remembered I said that because she came up to me one day and she goes, we found this ad in the paper. It's a local karate school. You want to try it out? I knew nothing about any styles. I just knew there was karate and kung fu. That's all I knew. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. sure. Why not? And I was 14 at the time. And um, I went to the school and did the first trial class. And it was very different than I expected. It was you know, a lot of pad work, a lot of, I mean, for the first trial class, he introduced me to a couple blocks. Uh, first kick, a couple punches, and I got like a little taste, a little sampler of like what the curriculum was like. I'm like, oh, this is cool, and I just mm. kept going back. And it was it was a Kempo school, it was a Tracy Kempo school, but at the time I didn't know what Kempo was. Uh, we actually just called it karate in the school, and I didn't know the difference between one art from the other. But I just knew that I like this. This is what I wanted to learn, and I just kind of that was my extracurricular. Like I'd go to school, and then I'd hang out with friends, and I would do karate, and that was pretty much it. And just that just became part of my lifestyle as I got older and I uh, never wanted to stop. Like I just knew once start, I started like, yeah, this is where I want to keep, keep training. I never want to stop this. Nice. So it was just random. Like the, the, the how and the when and the where was just kind of like, Hey, I want to try this. And it was just, my, yeah. just literally an ad in the paper. And then it just, it hooked me. So it's, it's that transition that I find interesting from this is a thing that I'm trying out or I'm doing, or I kind of enjoy to this is going to be part of my life forever. And we hear a lot of those stories on this show. And it's it's a part of the conversation that I think is under-discussed. Because I, I think whether you're uh, a school owner and you're trying to better understand how to retain students or you're starting out and you're you're not quite sure where it's going to take you, or maybe you've, you've just been training for you know, 40, 50, 60 years and you've been training so long and it's been such a big part of your life for so long that you kind of forget what it was like without it. And I think hearing those stories for, for those folks and a lot of others really can trigger some good stuff. So if you, if you remember, if you remember that transition from something I do to this is something I do, this is something I am. I'd like to hear about that. Um, It's, I would say the transition was a, a definitely a slow burn, um, because, of course, as a kid, you know, we got the curriculum and the syllabus and it's like, oh, well, here's what you learn. Here's the game plan. And it's, I remember there was a line and it just said, if you train hard, if you come regularly within four to five years, you can be a black belt. I'm thinking, oh, wow, like that was so far on the horizon. But mm-hmm. like, that's a cool goal to work towards. But as I took classes, I noticed that I became more comfortable with myself. Uh, my teacher definitely promoted, you know be more assertive i was an extremely extremely shy kid like when i was young i'd go to school and wouldn't talk for the first hour i just was really shy and training with a group of students my age and and engaging um and eventually assisting with kids um i started to become a little bit more assertive and i became more comfortable with being myself and also i became more comfortable with um controlling my body like it wasn't just like flailing, like, you know, if you don't know how to fight, you just flail, flail around. I started to learn coordination. I started to learn my my body and space. And, you know, as a kid, uh, one of the things that really terrified me was when a bigger kid would shove me, I felt mm-hmm. completely, completely powerless. I'm like, this kid physically moved my body. I don't know how to stop this. And it's just, even if it was psychological, the more I trained, the more comfortable I became in that asset of it. And it just, I want to say it just kind of like, collected myself and solidified myself into who I am. Like I felt more complete and more contained, if that makes any sense. It does. And, and just as I kept and the more I did it, the more I felt that way. And the, the stronger I felt and the healthier I felt and the more confidence I got, it was just something that became addictive, honestly. And it's, um, mm. and yeah, I've been in and out of it for, through different, I've, I've always trained, but the intensity and the frequency has always changed, but depending on what's been going on in life. But I always knew in the back of my mind that, I'm not going to stop this because this is some, almost like a lifeline. I need this. And if I don't do this, I'm going to lose that part of myself. I 
completely relate to that. And I suspect there are a lot of people, a lot in the audience. Who, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's, I mean, get it. Um, what is it you notice when you, when you have less intensity? Because if you have less intensity and then you have more intensity, I would imagine there's something you find. I, I, I miss this. I miss this aspect, this element of intense training. What is it that helps you get back into that more intense side? Um, a little bit of fear. I mean, this, you know, I'm getting oh. older too. I'm in my forties and sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to become sedentary. I don't want to become this person who used to do the martial arts, but you know, there's, I, I look at my friends and my, my family, everyone's getting older and it kind of scares me. And sometimes it's a little kick at the butt saying, Hey, keep moving. If you stop, you start to slow down, you know, the whole Rolling Stone gains on Moss sort of thing. I'm um, like, I don't want to get stuck to the point where this is the thing I used to do. So a lot of health reasons and motivations, just, I want to stay active and um, it's it's weird because it, if I don't go for a while, my concentration changes. Like I notice that if I'm working on the project, my focus isn't quite always as sharp as it should be or I get distracted easily and I kind of feel like I'm in a lull. But when I am in periods of time where I am actively training and working out and exercising, I get more focus. I get more motivation. I get more energy. And it's I, I could just see overall. So if, if, I, if I'm not training, I feel like I slow down and I don't like that feeling. So um, that's the main thing I know is I, I lose lack of focus. I, I get a little bit of laziness in there, which I hate. I hate feeling that way. And I kind of feel like I'm starting to become on the sideline versus actively doing something. So mm -hmm. uh, so when I do train and when I am in my, in my bursts of, you know, I'm being active, I feel much better overall, more focused and just more, more contained. Like I said before, I just, I feel more complete. Makes sense. Yeah, it's certainly something I can relate to. So you, you talked about Kempo, not knowing it was Kempo. You called it karate. Is that still where you're training now? Are you still in that art or have you moved around? Uh, I'm still in the art. Um, I went through a lot of transitions. Our school went through a lot of changes. Uh, we were a Tracy Kempo school for, for, for the first few years. And I didn't even know what that was until my instructor changed the name of the school to um because it was just called an east it was a franchise of east west karate um greg silva has a has a kempo franchise and we were one of the schools mm -hmm. and um he changed it to uh uh kempo karate i was like okay that's the first time he really started using the term kempo in class mm -hmm. and we switched over to, it was parker kempo and we always knew who had parker was he always told us we always had his picture up on the wall but i didn't realize we weren't training his art for the first few years so that was a weird interesting shift for me and um, I got stuck at that because he kind of froze us at our belt levels. I was a uh, first degree brown at the time, mm -hmm. and he froze a couple of us there. He goes, we're going to start the curriculum over. We're going to do a whole new set of material. I'm like, OK. So my first reaction was, uh, OK, starting over, but whatever. Um, but I love the new material right away. Like, I love the Parker material. And we did that for several years. And then, and then he decided to uh, go ahead and test us for black belt anyway. So he let us kind of dual train for about a year. There's an overlap mm. there where we we're doing early Parker material, but we're finishing up the, the teens portion of, of the Tracy system. And um, then he moved to another school and he started getting to um, some personal issues. He had a relationship with a, a underage student, which didn't end very well. And um, of course there was a whole, you know, the school shut down for about a month and he had to bring in another instructor while they were going through it was it was a mess it was an ugly mess mm -hmm. and then finally he decided to bow out and he sold the school to a, one of his former assistant instructors who was a great teacher and he took over so of course we started over again because that teacher mm -hmm. had been moving around and training new stuff so he came back started again from white belt so let's go back to the tracy stuff no no we stayed with okay. parker but oh, it was so it was now it was a um he was at this point in time with jeff speakman and it was what's, okay. what, which was kind of now known as 4.0 Kempo. So it was still Parker Kempo, but the order was a little bit different. The mm -hmm. techniques were a little bit different. So we just started over. And then I was working my way back up to Black Belt again. And then he left and went to the military and, and just ditched the school. And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> so for two years, I just trained on my own. I sought out, I talked to other instructors in the area. And that was probably one of the most important transitional points for myself. Because that's when I realized. How, how old are you at this point? At this point, I was that was 2005, so I was 26. Okay, and I'd been training for at that point in time, 13 years, yeah. and uh, like I said, we'd start over a few times. But that's when, like, I was on my own, and my first fear was, oh no, what do I do? What do I do? I I, I can't. I knew I couldn't stop. I didn't want to stop, and I didn't want to switch arts because I was really getting into the tempo, 
and um, I was curious about other artists, but I'm like, well, let me see what's around. And there's a bunch of schools around, and I talked to different instructors, and the one thing I noticed was everyone taught completely different, and that frustrated me. And I would go online, I would download manuals from this school, I'd go on the website of the school in Texas, and over here, just I, I compare, and then I realized that although all their curriculums were different, all their principles and the rules for this for the system were the same, and that's when I'm like, okay, that's when I realized there's different interpretations. And I just, just kept practicing and practicing the scene. And then when my instructor came back two years later, he reopened the school again and started teaching. So I'm like, okay, cool. And um, he had, at this point in time, he had Kempo 5.0. He'd been training with Speakman some more. Mm -hmm. So I started over again. But it was at this point in time, he started to teach me. He's like, he goes, it's not about the formula. He goes, it's not about the techniques. He goes, don't worry about the memorization. He goes, it doesn't matter if you hit the guy 20 times super fast, if you're not doing anything. So he started to yeah. slow everything down and break it apart. He taught me how to take the system apart and kind of like analyze the pieces and put it back together. Like, why are we doing this move? Why are we doing this stance? Why are they here together? And over the course of another like 10 years, no, like an eight years with him, um, he changed her curriculum almost daily. I'd come in and it would be different than last week. And it was like, okay, we're doing it this way today. But it was because it's like, because there's no set way to do it. So it was always evolving, always changing. And so at this point in time, I've had Tracy Campo, traditional Parker Campo, Speakman 4.0, Speakman 5.0, a hybrid Kempo, and he started teaching MMA uh, classes, and, and he trained his fighters, so he started bringing that into it, so it became this big hybrid, and I just started kind of mishmashing it together. But, but I would imagine at that point, it's not phasing you anymore. The because you've weren't... done that kind of, the, the, I, I would call it research, of seeing, you know, it's all, the principles are the same, it's just different ways of implementing it. Exactly. So you're, I'm imagining you're just kind of rolling with those punches, pun not intended, yeah. As well, yeah. Things are shifting around. Exactly. And it was weird. Like the last couple of years felt weird because um he was training me differently than the other students because you know, new students would come in, they'd be on that curriculum. But I was still and at this point in time, I'm training for my second degree, third degree. So he's teaching me the extensions and techniques from the previous stuff I was learning, in addition to the new stuff. So I was kind of like on this parallel course with the class and there were a lot of days where um he would teach a class and i would participate and then we'd break off and he'd have me off to the side working on my own material and he'd work with me for a little bit and he'd come over here to the class so i was a lot of times i was training alongside the class not always inside the class and it was an interesting dynamic but um but yeah i got used to it i would literally walk in he goes oh, hey damn instead of, instead of doing it this way we're gonna do it this way from now on i'm like okay okay cool and by the time the his last year to school was open in 2015. I could tell he was burnt out. He'd been doing um, on his own, teaching CrossFit classes, kids classes all day, teens and adults classes at night, and then training his fighters after that. And he'd go home at like 10, 11 o'clock, be back the next morning at five. You can only do that for so long. It's too much. And I could tell that the, um, the, the, the Kempo classes were suffering at that point. They were starting to get really watered down. We went from the whole curriculum down to like three techniques per belt and then with other MMA stuff mixed in. But it was you could tell that the gas was running out. Mm. And finally, he 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 burnt out and he decided he found a new opportunity and he moved to North Carolina and shut the school down for good. And I just kept training on my own. And um, right now I'm training with um, another good friend. He's uh, Sensei Alex. I've had him on the channel before. He's got a school. Um, he invites me over a lot. I work with him and his his group and um. And also uh, Master Sean Kelly's a good friend as well. He, he, he Everybody kind of like welcomed me into their circle. And mm -hmm. it was very um, – I really appreciate that because my instructor didn't leave on the best of terms with everyone. He kind of ruffled a lot of feathers. But they – everyone kept that separate – like they're like, even though I trained with them, they didn't group me in with that. So they all welcomed me in. So I've got a lot of people around here, a great support system. I train independently but with these close friends and I've learned probably more in the past couple of years than I did in the 10 years yeah. before that because of the insight and breaking it down. And I'm just loving the system more and more. And just to diversify a little bit, um, the same year I started this channel, I also wanted to try a different art. I'm like, let me, let me try something new as well. I needed mm. a change. So, and that's when um, I found a local jujitsu school that also teaches judo. And um, I fell in love with that. And I found that, that, um, it was so different than Kempo, but also similar enough where it meshed perfectly. So now I've been doing that as well. And that's becoming something that I can't see myself not doing. Oh, cool. Nice. What do you think you would have done? Of course, it's purely hypothetical. If you had not had all of those kind of iterations of what you were training, 
when your instructor left. Because what you're talking about is a story that so many people have. And I hear this all the time. I get emails, I don't want to say constantly, but frequently. I've been training at this school for 10, 15, 20 years. I love this system. It's all I know. My instructor just quit, retired, moved, passed away. I don't know what to do. And of course, the answer is, is you find another place to train. But there's always this concern, this worry, fear that because it's different. Well, I, you know, I've been training in, 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 in Kempo and there's a Kempo school nearby, but it's different Kempo and it's not the same. And I don't want to start over or I like what I did right for whatever reason. But it sounds to me because you had this experience of just starting over, starting over, starting over, it became not about the curriculum, that body of material, but rather I, I get the sense you, you just want to train and learn. That's kind of what's coming through for mm -hmm. me. So big setup for the hypothetical. If you hadn't had those transitions, what do you think you would have done with your training when your instructor left? The first time? When he when the when the school shut down the first time when this when the, when the when the school shut down and and this most recent time because I, I think it's important there's kind of that bad taste ruffling feathers you know if, if oh, it had okay. been continuous up till that point how do you think that would have gone oh okay so if I didn't have all those changes and oh I see what you're yeah. saying so if, okay um honestly I probably would have just found another campus school and because okay. I would have been training twenty some years at that point and I would have been hopefully comfortable in what i knew at that point like i would have been probably very well versed in that particular curriculum set hmm. and i honestly i probably would have just joined another another Kempo school or or maybe another uh, maybe another Kempo school and still gone the jujitsu route or another art altogether um hmm. if that was the first change yeah i probably there's, there's a couple schools i would have that i had talked to i probably would have just joined up with and been with now and so i would have probably had just done one tr transitional period versus the multiple and i'm sure my outlook would be very different um i probably wouldn't be so used to looking at it from different angles and might i might have had more of a struggle with that in terms of the change mm -hmm. might have been more like well i've been doing it this way for 20 years now it's hard for me to learn to do it this way uh so it probably would have been a rougher transition but i see myself just joining up a different school at that point and, and i would say that that's because you know, your, your passion for training exceeds your, your passion for rank. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to dismiss rank, but for a lot of people, that's, that's the hang up. It's, I don't, I don't want, I hear that. I don't want to start mm -hmm. over, which is, which is a shame because then they end up not doing anything. Yeah. Is... And, the, and that's the thing that changed too, is the whole concept of what rank was like the rules for my, mm -hmm. my very first instructor. Um, He was going to make me a second degree, second degree black belt once I, went through my Parker material because I had Tracy and it was, so he was going to do it that way. But when he changed and left the school and we had the new instructor come in, he started us over and we had to go through that material and then learn the extensions the proper way and write the thesis the proper way. So I was like, okay. I mean, it took me 11 years to go from first degree to second degree black belt, just because of all the changes. And by that point too, you know, I, you know, I did third degree under him and fourth degree and it, but it, it became at that point too. I was like, it's just where I'm in the curriculum. Like it doesn't really matter. Like I have, sparred people and over the years who were higher ranked than me that I, I, I dominated, but I've also had people that were lower ranked than me that dominated me. So it's like the rank doesn't really mean anything. And it just got to the point where, you know, I, I wear it in class or I wear, it, you know, sometimes just teaching. But other than that though, I don't really care about the rank because it does, it doesn't really mean anything anymore because it's just another thing you wear. It's just to show where you are in the curriculum. It doesn't say what you know or what your experience really is. It's just when you're in class, okay, well, this is what I've, complete up to on this list i still have this much to go it's just about the materials i'm really and at a point now i just want to understand why it's written the way it is mm -hmm. how to recognize patterns how to actually take what the material is teaching and actually apply it in real situations or how to apply it in sparring and it's really about the quality of the knowledge now and not not the rank i don't i couldn't care less about the rank anymore to be mm -hmm. honest how has the cross training in this other school changed either what you do, how you do, or how you see maybe your Kempo work? Um, well, that's actually a great question because the first thing was it was incredibly uncomfortable. And it's the yeah. first time I had experienced something so different. Like, you know, I'd looked at other arts, you know, karate is very similar. Tong still is very similar in terms of, you know, the stances are, are comparable and, you know, they use the same type of punches. But with judo and jujitsu, our stances are very different. Mechanics are very different. We didn't, 
you know, in Kempo, we don't do a lot of throws, like like the, the shoulder throws, the hip throws. There's a, there's a few takedowns, but they're different. So I had a really hard time getting used to doing the the shoulder throw by turning my back. I hated doing the whole thing of turning my back. It was so unnatural. I fought against it. And because I fought against it, I wasn't placing my feet correctly. I wasn't doing it correctly mechanically for a long time until I had to take a step back. And I'm listening to my instructor and he's teaching me and I've seen him teach other students. And then it, it, it slowly sank in. And um, eventually I got out of that that um, hold up and I started to relax a little bit and realize, well, you know, I'm not gonna just gonna go up to a person and just turn my back to them. It's usually, you know, you're, you already have them off balance or you're in the middle of a fight and you've got that leverage and you, you're in the position for it. Um, but I noticed a lot of overlap too. There were a lot of techniques he shows us. I'm like, oh wait, we have that exact same technique in Kempo, that same takedown, that same grab, mm-hmm. that same counter grab. And I realized, and that's where I started to see where Ed Parker drew from a lot of influence because Kempo's got a lot of, he put judo in there. He put boxing in there. There's Kung Fu in there. It's a mixture. And I started to see these layers come in. And um, I would say where the biggest mesh is right now, where I think the two really married together very well is doing a Kempo technique. And instead of doing like our, one of our classic extensions, I will finish off with a judo technique. I find that judo techniques are very good for transitions from one position to another or to finish off something or to, you, you added, I could add this take down in here. Um, they just started blending incredibly well. And now mm. in my head, I, I know if I'm bored, or if I'm daydreaming, I will just practice like techniques in my head. I'll try to visualize, Oh, well, if I do the first few steps from here, that puts me in a position for this, this wrist lock. And then I can do this takedown. And I just started to really open my eyes that a lot of concepts um, transcend multiple arts. And that if you can look for those similarities that they can actually uh, mesh together extremely well and become very powerful combinations. But it also um, opened my eyes a lot to, wow, this is a very different system culturally, mechanically, philosophically, everything is such a different system. And it made me realize that, you know, not all arts are the same, that there really is a wide, wide world. And that's part of the influence of on our channel is that we started to explore other arts, um, their history and the, and the, the origins of arts. Cause now I got fascinated and well, wow, if this is so different, well, what else is so different? And um, I would say the clash of culture was extremely eye opening for myself. Mm. Mm. Have you bumped into anything? What's, what's the word I'm looking for? Res- skeptical, resistant as, as you're, cause I get the sense that you, you, you're pretty open. You strike me as, as someone who's pretty open with their training and probably philosophically in life in general. And that means you're going to experience be and find a lot of different stuff. If you're, if, you, if we call it all cross training, if you're cross training in these different things, you're talking to these different people. Have you had situations where you've gone uh, and you're resistant to it saying, no, uh, whether that's from yourself or past training. Um, yes. Uh, there's been, there's, there's a lot of the Kempo techniques I don't like. Um, I'm not a fan of our weapons techniques. I don't think the weapon defense is there. Um, I am starting to learn that with the group I'm learning with right now, they are showing me, this is interesting because there's, I've always had a list of techniques I've hated and I I do them to get through them in class historically, but then like, I just kind of skip past them, but training with uh, Sensei Alex and his group and his instructor, um, they'll ask, well, what's the, what's the trouble technique? So I'll bring up this one. Oh, I don't like this technique. They break it apart. And they 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 get it to a point. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I see why it's not, and it's not always meant for a self defense situation. But it's teaching a particular right. concept. Either it's related to something else we learned earlier, or it's even showing you an alternative way of doing something, or it's something that we've already done before, but in a different application. And I've got to the point of, okay, well, now I can now I can appreciate why it is the way it is. I don't always like them, um, but the weapons techniques, I don't. They're not my favorite. Um, Kempo lacks a lot in in ground fighting, which is why I went to the, the mm-hmm. grappling side, the judo, jiu-jitsu. But no, there's there are techniques that a lot of times, both in judo and, and in Kempo, and I'll see people teach stuff. I go, mm, okay, I'm gonna do it this way in class, but I'm not gonna actually I don't I don't like that. I'm not going to I don't feel comfortable doing it, or I maybe I in my mind I think it should be done a different way. Um I come across a lot of arts doing research where I go, mm, not not my favorite. I wouldn't do that. And, you know, I visited the school once. They had me in. It was a wonderful experience. Great bunch of guys. I wasn't that impressed with the art itself, and I don't want to name what it is. Sure. Uh, but they had but they had some they had some techniques in the devil. I was like, oh, okay, well, that was pretty cool. Oh, well, that hurt. Okay, that, that wow, that was impressive. But as a whole, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't train in this. Um, but but then I tried I, I when I hit those points, I, I get that gut reaction of eh, no, I, I don't like that. And then I 
trying to step back and like, okay, but who would like that? Or, you know, they're making it work. They like that. It's just not for me. Or, so or yeah, why I, don't you like that? Um, a yeah. lot of times I, I don't agree with it. Sometimes I'm like, there are times I'm like, I don't think that's going to work or I don't see that right. being practical or I don't think I can move that way. Like I, I tend to shy away from the love of the Chinese arts mainly because my, I don't think my body can move that way. And I've never felt comfortable, which is ironic because Kempo is Chinese. It's it's mm. more, it's more Kung Fu than anything, but it's got a lot of karate characteristics, but a lot of the, like, like Wing Chun, I struggle with, I've got a lot of friends who do Wing Chun and um, I, I have a high respect for the art. I don't think I'd be good at it. I don't think I could move that way. I don't think my body, and maybe that's just my, myself psyching myself out, but there's a lot of arts I look at and like, that's cool, but I don't think I could be physically capable of doing it. Or I don't, or other arts I look at, I'm like, that's cool, but I don't necessarily like it the way they approach X, Y, Z. So sometimes it's just down to whether I think it's practical versus whether it appeals to me or uh, whether or not I think I could do it myself. I think the important part, the part I was trying to get out of that from you was that you're thinking about it. And I think that that's the most important part is, excuse me, when, when you bump up to something you're resistant against, it, it begs a question. Why don't I like this? Why doesn't this work for me? And I think more important than learning the technique or suffering through it or, or what changing your mind or whatever. I think far more important than that is understanding what it is in yourself that makes you say, I disagree with this. I don't like this because there's, there's insight there. And, and I, I find it myself, you know, um, I think we've all, well, I, I suspect everyone, but I, I'm fairly certain both you and I have had the experience of training with someone, regardless of rank or setting where just from the first moment, you're like, I don't like this person. I don't think they know anything. And now I'm going to suffer through this seminar or whatever, and I'm not going to get anything out of it. And and when I was younger, I would just kind of, I'd be watching the clock or if there was no clock, imagining the clock, how soon can I get out of here and do something that, you know, that works, that matters, that's good, that makes me better. And now I, I've, I've come to realize that sometimes what makes me better is what not to do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I can observe, you know, what is it about this person that they're a terrible teacher or what is it about the material they've selected that just so philosophically doesn't work for me? And, and you, you said, you know, will it work for somebody else, you know, and observe what, what's going on. Are other people having a better experience? Is there something I can learn from that? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I was going to say, if I'm in a seminar now, um, fortunately I've, I've liked most seminars I've been to, but yeah, I've, a couple of times there's, there's been times where I'm like, nah, I'm not really liking this. But if I'm in that situation, I tend to look around the room and I do watch how others are responding to it because sometimes, and it's actually happened a couple of times, maybe I'm not, I don't like what's being taught or, or the, or the instructor themselves, but the person I'm partnered up with knows something more than I do. And I like working with them because, okay, well, they're making X, Y, Z work and they're teaching me something different, or I just like working with the person or I start looking around the room. Well, they're smiling. They're, they're doing it this way. So I try to, I, I do try to read other people's reactions to see how they're taking in the material, because like you said, it's right, because are they getting something out of it? And if, if they're just going along, you can tell if someone's just going along with it or if they're breaking it down and trying to digest it. Mm-hmm. And I try to separate that. Okay. Well, they're just doing what he says versus, Oh, well, he's doing something a little bit different or doing something that he's, he's making it work. What's he doing right. That I'm not seeing or that he's maybe not getting across the instruction. And um, I, I try to take away at least one thing from 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 a seminar if possible. And like you said, even if it's too, well, that's not the way I'm going to do it. Or I, that's an example of how not to do it. That's still a positive. You can still come away, walk away with something new that you didn't have going in. Right. Right. We've talked a little bit about kind of the real world applicability. And, and I find with any martial artist, the the stuff that they know and the stuff that they will use right it's always a, a we've got the big toolbox and we've got the little toolbox how do you determine what goes in your little toolbox it's a great question that's actually something i've been trying to think about because as everyone who criticizes Kempo knows we have like a million and a half techniques <laughs> um it's interesting because there's a lot of basics like when you, when you first start out you, you every belt level has this list of punches this is the blocks this is just list of stances this list of kicks and by the time you get the black belt you've pretty much at least seen every kick of every art but it's not in our techniques there's a lot of technique a lot of stuff in our techniques or, or i'm sorry on our basics list that don't make it into techniques and i've observed that 
it seems to be that we're introduced to a lot of stuff and I've talked to other instructors and the whole concept is, well, we're going to show you all the tools there are in the world and you're going to pick your favorite based on, you know, what, what you take to. And the way I like to look at it is, okay, so you're learning about tools. So you're learning about how hammers work, how wrenches work and saws and power tools and all that. But then you ask yourself, what am I going to do? Am I going to be a plumber? Am I going to be an electrician? Am I going to be a carpenter? And you kind of find like, so am I going to compete? If I'm doing this for self-defense, if I'm doing this for tournament kata divisions, am I doing this just for health or rehab? And then I start to find the tools of that toolbox that fit that niche. And then I fine tune and focus on those as my core. And the other stuff is good. You you, you recognize it when you see it, but if you're, if you're, if your um your goal is just tournament fighting, okay, well you're gonna learn you're gonna swing away from this set of techniques and tools and focus more on this, and that's where I've been trying to um look at arts certain ways and categorize how because there's so many people who are like well that would never work for self defense and then my question is well but wh why wouldn't it work for something else or maybe it could work for self defense in a different context or maybe it would work and maybe someone else is using that in competition it's I try to look at the specific tool and see where it where a person would apply it. And in my own experience, like I said, I will look at um, what, what's my purpose and I take my tools and I, I kind of group them based on my my desire, which is I want to be self-defense or I want to have self-defense. I want to be stronger and healthier and be able to move. I'm not I'm not looking at the competition. I'm not looking to get into the ring, you know, and I'm not doing it just for a kata division. I want to make stuff work for self-defense. So I tend to analyze everything based on that perspective. Hmm. It makes sense. And I think it's an important conversation that one has with themselves because whether you realize it or not it's a process that we all do right we all learn you know all these moves 108 109 combinations or whatever maybe mm -hmm. and more if you start putting them together yourself and say okay well i like this this works well for me and one of the things i find interesting and i don't i won't quite say it drives me nuts but it it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck not that i have very much anymore when i see someone who they're working some self-defense you know from you know this attack or this attack or this attack and they end up defending in a fairly similar way each time and i see the instructor say all right but do something different but it works but why mm -hmm. They've got something that's dialed in and it works for them in these 17 different ways. Isn't that a good mm -hmm. thing? What do you think? No, I think that's a good thing. And that comes down to the instructor. And and okay, I had an experience recently. Um, I really enjoyed this. A few months ago, our jujitsu school held a black belt test. And it was my first mm -hmm. time actually witnessing a black belt test in this art. Mm -hmm. And we had a guest instructor from New York come down from a sister school. And it was just really interesting to watch because this is material that's way above me. I mean, I'm seeing them do these combinations stuff. I'm like, I haven't even seen that in class yet. But there was one drill in particular that I found extremely intimidating yet motivating at the same time. They had to, um, with his partner, uh, basically uh, the instructor would be like, okay, so he's going to grab your wrist, defend it, do a combination, do something. And he had to do whatever came to his mind. And but the only rule was you couldn't do the same combination twice. Mm -hmm. And he didn't just have to do it a couple of times. He was okay. He asked him like 30 times, okay, defend yourself, defend yourself, defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And if he repeated the same combination, he was done. But you know, he maybe he started off with a wrist turn or, or or the particular lock. Okay, that's fine. He could use that lock again if it was later down the sequence. So the person in his mind, he had to like remember the order of what he had already done. And he had to try to anticipate what was going to, what he was going to do next. And he had about four seconds to make these decisions. Wow. And it was really cool. And there were so many times where, yeah, it was fascinating. And there was so many times like, well, he did the same thing and they actually stopped it. And he's like, wait, how, what did you just do? And he had to explain it. Well, well, the body position was slightly different or his foot position mm -hmm. was different. So the mechanically was different, but at face value, it looked exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there in awe. I'm like, how is he pulling out 30 combinations off the top of his head like that? without repeating but he's keeping track of what he's done and what he's going to do and the groupings and categories while doing it on the fly mm -hmm. and i thought that was such a fascinating drill to watch and it was it was really enjoyable to see a test done in this way because i hadn't seen that before yeah and and then they did the same thing okay now he's grabbing me by the shoulder by the by the collar now he's grabbing me around the neck and they had to do it over over and it's just that that spontaneity and yeah you start to see that people do rely on specific move sets like you, people get their favorites because either it's something you're good at or it's something that makes sense or something that's just so universally applicable that you're going to rely on that but but to see it done in such an 
and a spontaneous way in combinations and make it different each time was extremely eye opening. But um, yeah, I, I my thought on that is I think that um, we do resort to our favorites, and if it works, if it works for you, there's no reason to change it. Just just as long as you're honest with yourself about why is it working, is it just because I'm used to it, or is it actually mechanically good for me? And how can I improve it? If you always keep the open mind about how you could add to it and improve it, I think that's healthy. But we're going to resort to what works for us. And if it works for you, stick with it. I, I spar a guy. He handed my butt to me this weekend. He's he's in the 60s. He's still very, very active. He competes. But he is he fights like a 20-year-old. No joke. He is incredibly quick. But he does like four moves. And he doesn't even change his size. He's always in one stance and he does like four moves, but they get in it and they work for him and they mm -hmm. work for him beautifully. So he, why change it if it works? Right. right. When, I, when I think that, I think, you know, the example of Bill Wallace. Right? Exactly. Three kicks, four punches. And he's very open about that. Mm -hmm. like, I got I got seven techniques, but he's got a million and one ways to implement them, which reminds exactly. me, as you were talking about this testing, well, the move might look the same on the surface, but now we're applying it at a diff different angle where the foot positioning is different, this balance is different. And I think that that comes from doing those moves a million and one times and really understanding them and where to apply them. Because, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to use your hammer in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes you're, mm -hmm. you're, Putting you're you're straightening a nail. Sometimes you're driving a nail. Sometimes you're pulling a nail. But the hammer is valid for all of those things. And the more practice you have with that, the more you realize, you know, here's a situation I could use the hammer. Maybe I could also use this, or maybe I could also use that. Maybe the crowbar is a better tool here. But I've got the hammer with me. I know it'll work. Might take me, you know, ten percent extra effort, but let's do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Right on. So when when you think about your training now, where uh, self-directed is is what I'm going to call it. It sounds like you're spending plenty of time with other people, but you're driving, you're deciding what, when, where, how, and of course, why you train. When you when you think about your philosophy now, because you've been exposed to so many different things, if, if we, let, let's pretend we were going to make a school out of what you're doing, you know, and, and certainly you're aware of the marketing elements of martial arts so how how might we brand this how might we codify it how would you describe your curriculum your training methodology interesting question that's something i've been i don't want to use the word wrestling with but something i've been actually trying to work out for myself for the past couple mm -hmm. of years um i've re i've redrafted myself my own curriculum about two three times in the past couple of years because i'm okay. trying to answer i'm trying to answer that question that's great. um and that's with who I'm learning with now, um, uh, Mr. Alex and his instructor, they're teaching me such root level concepts. Like I'm learning why a technique was written a specific way. Why is it here in the curriculum? What does it relate to? And I'm trying to take that and kind of use that as my basis. And I'm going through my Tracy techniques. Just, um, I've pretty much stopped with the Tracy techniques, but there's a there's a handful I liked, so I'm keeping mm. those. Um, I've learned the Parker techniques. I've learned probably each technique three, four different ways. So I ask myself, well, which way do I prefer? Or does it even matter which way I prefer it? But I'm going to, I'm going to keep this technique for this reason. And there's um, Kempo 5 stuff I love. And um, I will take a lot of their concepts. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I guess, piecemeal my own curriculum together, but I'm trying to sort out well, what, I don't want to say what replaces what, because I don't want to get stuck in that whole thing. Because see, I'm trying to write it out for myself. So I'm trying to decide, sure. okay, what, what list am I going to work off of? I'm trying to make a master list with the concept of it's going to be fluid. Um, so where I am right now is just I'm trying to stick to traditional Ed Parker karate, Kempo, and take everything I'm learning with that. And now I'm reaching out to, okay, well, now I like – X, Y, Z from, from Speakman 5.0, I'm bringing it in. I'm going to now put it here. I like these techniques from Tracy. I'm going to put it here. But now I've got all this jujitsu and judo stuff. Well, I'm going to add this here. So like what I've been working on, I've got like a sheet for each belt level. So if I were to start a school or mm -hmm. if I'm, I kind of teach my, I'm trying to approach myself as a student. So here's my syllabus for, for white belt. So I'm putting in there, okay, with Kempo techniques, one through 10. Uh, here's a couple of 5.0 techniques. Here's my basics and, and these couple of throws. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to group it that way. So if I were to brand this, as you would say, I would do kind of more back to the Kempo Jiu Jitsu, um, where it's more of a stand up grappling mix with the Kempo techniques that I'm learning now, like the traditional Ed Parker Kempo with a handful of uh, 5 sprinkled in. Okay. I like it. 
and, and it, it sounds like you're being really intentional with this, with a, I, I find interesting. Most people don't do this. They don't take it to that degree, but which kind of begs the question, do you think you'll open your own school? No, I really never had. Interesting. It's 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 interesting. Like I, I taught children mainly. My instructor, it was actually my first my f- first job I ever had. Mm. And it's a funny story because I was in high school and you know, I wanted to apply for a job. And I'm like, OK, well, let me ask my instructor. In the back of my head, I thought I was applying for the front desk, like like the reception area. And, you know, I interviewed and I'm like, okay, cool. And like, okay, you start on Monday. I'm like, cool. So I came in and they put me on the floor. I'm like, huh? Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. I was 16, 17. I was 17 at the time. I hadn't taught kids yet. And then all, all next thing I knew, I'm like, ah, uh, I'm, I'm on the floor mm. next to my instructor. And he hands me a group of students to go work with. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm teaching now. But it was a great experience because teaching is a great way to learn explaining mm-hmm. stuff back to the kids even though they're kids just the act of explaining it helped me understand it better and he always yeah. told me too he goes if you can't teach it to somebody else and you don't know it and um so i taught for for a few years with him and he wanted to branch out before he got into his, his problems he was going to open up a second school and he asked me if i was interested in running it and i turned it down because one i was i was in college at the time i was already working two part-time jobs and i didn't really want to teach as a profession teaching as a profession is hard i i know people who've done it and my friends who do it they do a great job at it but it's it's a full commitment and i love martial arts is a good chunk of my life it's my passion for me to do but it's not necessarily a profession for me to run a school Mm. um I have considered and I am considering doing like online programs, you know, or, or doing like some like video seminars. And I, I do like teaching seminars. So I don't, I don't mind teaching. I like teaching, but I don't necessarily want to hunker down and actually open up a brick and mortar school and, you know, do kids birthday classes or, or, or day camp. It's just, it's just not what my passion is. My passion is video production. It's creative writing and it's martial arts and art of one dojo meshes it all together. And um, like I said, I, I do like teaching. So seminars are good. Um, videos would be good. I would like to do some of those and possibly online courses. But as far as opening the school, I don't see myself doing that just because I don't have, I don't think I would do very well with it, honestly, because I it's not where my passion lies in terms of a business sense of running the school. It's just, I don't think I could do it. I get that. I get that. Now, of course, the vast majority of our audience are martial artists and there is a decent cross-section of those who run a school. Mm -hmm. Video is becoming a much bigger element in today's marketing, whether it's social media, whether it's on websites, whether, you know, uh, YouTube Vimeo are recruitment techniques. And and even over the last couple of years, there's a lot of content, a lot of curriculum went online, which a lot of schools discovered (gasps) there's a retention element here too. What, what quick things without, you know, tons of gear, tons of time, tons of money, what quick tips might you have for those schools to elevate the quality of their videos? Um, The number one thing is make sure your audio is clean. There's nothing more off putting than bad sounds. And it's uh, as far as film production goes, Audio quality is better than visual quality. So, like, if you you can watch a bad video, but like 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 if it's grainy or, or poorly lit, but if it sounds good, you can still be engaged. But if you're watching something that's perfectly polished and beautiful and looks fantastic, but it's got horrible room echo, you're going to be pulled out of it. So, I think if you're going to do an online class program, make sure it's the audio quality is very clean. Wear a microphone. Don't just do a camera mic across the room. It sounds terrible. It's harder for the students to understand, and it, it breaks that engagement. If the sound is clear and clean, you have someone who can hear your instruction clearly. There's no mistakes being made, and it just helps with that immersion. Um, f- framing is another big thing too. I wouldn't don't just set up a laptop and have it on the floor tilted upwards. It's uncomplimentary it's harder for this, students this, this angle this yeah, angle ex- <laughs> exactly that's not a good angle to teach from so you yeah. want to have a good shot where you know you want the student to be able to see what you're doing so make sure the shot is framed up make sure you got plenty of room to do it make sure it sounds good i mean lighting yeah, i mean you can make it pretty if you want but it's that's not what people are going to care about that they if someone's watching they want to see what you're doing they want to be able to repeat and and get that information so make sure the camera can see your whole body and it's not some weird angle or or you know and, and don't use like a little standard definition low res webcam that you can't see anything anyway um and have good sound and then i think that's a really big part of it 
the schools who are doing it well do it well but there's a lot of instruction i've seen online i'm like I, I couldn't watch a class that way because it's it's it pulls I'm so distracted by not being able to follow that it pulls me out of the lesson. Yeah. I, I think the everything you're talking about and some some things that I'm gonna add fall under the heading of you're trying to simulate the class experience. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how people learn, they need to be able to hear you, they need to be able to see you more or less, they need to be able to see all of you, you know, just because you're you're demonstrating a hand technique or a kick doesn't mean that they don't need to see the planted foot or the stance. They want to, you know, you need to show it from different angles. Otherwise they're going to watch it. And there's, there's a beautiful thing that happens with video. They can pause, mm -hmm. they can rewind, they can watch it again. But if you do it poorly, there's also the ability to skip ahead. If, if you're creating right. skippable video, that that's not serving you in any way. You want video that makes them go, I want to see that again. I want to see that again. I want to pause that. Okay. Okay. And now I'm going to show you from, from the other way. And they turn around and they're talking you through it now. Okay. All right. Now I get it. Cause you can't turn around and then see what they're doing. Right. Like it's it, right. You put I, I'm glad that shoes. you brought that up that you just, yeah, you hit it nail on the head right there doing it different angles, different perspectives, because I don't know. How, I can't speak for other people, but when I'm watching the video, I try, and like you said, I can't, face this way and watch the video that's over there. But what I will try to do is I do try to orient myself at least somewhat to kind of mirror it. So I can even yeah. watch out the corner of my eye, but seeing things from a different perspective can totally change whether or not a student gets the concept or not. And yeah. I, I'll bring this up in jujitsu. Ju um, that's how I finally got the shoulder throw working. My instructor showed me over and over and over and over again. He explained it. I got the concept of it, but something was wrong. Something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And he kept correcting me, and I didn't see it until I watched him do it on video. It was a different angle. I stopped just, just from the perspective. I went, oh, his feet are different. His feet are there. And then when I started doing that, it started working better. But he'd been yeah. trying to tell me I couldn't see it until I saw it from another angle. So I think you're absolutely correct, being able to do it from different angles so that the student can see. And there's also the question is, are you talking about a video that's pre-recorded and played back or a live instruction? A live instruction, they can, they can. there's a question that back and forth, they can move and highlight certain things. But if it's pre-recorded, I think you're absolutely right. Show it from multiple different angles because you don't know what the person on the other end is going to see from one angle versus the other. It's, they might not even know what to look for until they see it. Some of the best stuff I've ever seen in demonstrating physical movement, actually, it doesn't come from the martial arts. It's, you remember the, the beach body programs when they were super big deal, you know, P90X mm -hmm. and everything, they would have different people standing in slightly different ways. Sometimes they, one would face the camera, one would face away and, and you watch those fitness videos and there's always someone that you can watch. Okay. No, no. Okay. I, now I get it. Right. So you get four to six examples in real time. And that's something that I have not seen happening with this current crop of transition to online. I would love to see, I'm going to face you. Students going to be here facing the other way. Maybe we've even got someone facing 90 degrees over here. So you can you can just quickly look. And I think that it's such a, a valuable element because as you said, those angles are so critical. And if you don't have the real-time feedback of someone, uh, switch your feet. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's the other hand. You could get, you know, four hours in, several weeks of classes, and then go, okay, now I gotta go back. And it's disheartening. Absolutely. No, I think that's a fantastic idea. That's that would be great to see that in the background, because then you could see someone like you said, you can see it in real time, people doing it on each other in different body types. That would be a great, a great example. Um, I do want to bring up I was looking at an online program a couple of years ago and I started it. I haven't gone back to it. I do want to go back to it just to complete it for the sake of completing it. But I ran into an issue right off right at the beginning with one of the stances, the way he was teaching the stances and it was traditional karate. Um, my feet were out, it was like the front stance, but my feet were out wide, like past my shoulder, outside my shoulder rim. And I felt very unstable. It was very uncomfortable. I'm like, this doesn't feel right. I'm like, I feel like I'm way too wide. And I emailed him and asked him, and he goes, oh no, he goes, your feet should be within your shoulder line. I'm like, but your video has it out here. And he's That's like- That's not what you demonstrated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was a legitimate answer, but his answer to me was, oh, well, I do it exaggerated because I see that people don't tend to actually go the full distance or no, people tend to, what was his answer? 
he he said he did it exaggerated because people don't always go the full range of what he teaches. So if, if he does it if he does it over and bigger and people are going to shrink it down, I'm thinking, no, I think you just. What did it about wrong the people who are trying to do it just as you demonstrated? Yeah, and like you, prob- like I would yeah, do exactly. But the problem was, had I not asked him, this is a core basic stance and the white belt level of the material. You have someone yeah. do this and do this for a couple of years, you have completely destabilized their whole training because that is yeah. foundational. And that's where I think a lot of the live the live instruction needs to come into play because you could have someone correct you, but that kind of freaked me out. I'm like, I'm glad I asked them. It it felt wrong. It didn't feel right. And I don't quite accept the answer. I think it just wasn't demonstrated right on camera. And that's a scary thing is how many videos out there are like that. Biomechanically, a front stance outside your shoulders is not is not going to be great for your hips long term. No, it, it, it hurt from, to do from it. What I'm feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention you're not gonna be able to move. No, but I had I was like completely off balance too. I'm like, this just something's not right with this. And he's like, oh no, no, it should definitely be within your shoulder stance. I'm thinking, then hmm. you might want to change that video out then. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. You know, there is a there is a crop of instructors, and and you probably experienced them. I've certainly experienced them, where they'll demonstrate, and instead of acknowledging, you know what, I'm not the best at this. I don't do great at this. Here's how I do it. Um, you over here, younger, older, lower, higher rank, whatever. Show me how you do. Yeah, that's closer to what I want you to do. do don't don't fault. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be fallible. Mm-hmm. As an instructor, you don't have to be perfect. And I, I your I, your sense is kind of what what I think mine would be of. Yeah, I didn't realize I was doing it that way. I don't want to go back and refilm all those videos. So I'm going to give kind of a dodgy answer as to why it's why it's like that. And it's unfortunate mm-hmm. because it, it could have been an opportunity for the instructor to say, you know what? Thank you. Yeah. I have, haven't have had anybody supervising my material in a long time. You just gave me something to work on. I'm going to go back and refilm those videos. Let me give you a free month or whatever as a thank you, right? Because yeah. then you would have been like, whoa, I like this person. You know, right? clearly they're still learning. It continues to blow my mind that there are instructors in the world who think they have to be and remain perfect indefinitely in order to be worthy of teaching a, a instructor does not have to be a superhero like you know you want to be relatable to a student too and like you said it's okay to it's okay to make a mistake it's okay to be thank you for pointing it out or or that's just not something i do as well it, like you said it's okay to be vulnerable i, I agree with that 100 percent. and and more importantly it gives your students permission to be imperfect mm-hmm. and it's something that i see when i see because I, I get the opportunity to travel around and teach and and when I see schools where the culture from from the the upper ranks is that you know we're perfect, don't question us. If if there's something I don't do well, I'm never going to demonstrate it. I'm going to make somebody else demonstrate it. There's so much pressure. There's so much tension in the mm-hmm. student ranks, and you can you can feel it, and you can feel that as they as they get you know they get their first degree, second, third, and you know usually around fourth or fifth they stop doing anything. They just teach and they teach mm-hmm. verbally and they make other people demonstrate because they're maybe they're not as good as they once were and they're terrified. And then the other schools where the instructor's like, oh, I'm showing you guys the wrong thing. <laughs> Whoops. Hold on. Forget everything we did in the last five minutes. You'll learn that in another two years. Here's how we're doing. And everybody laughs about it. They're like, wow, we messed up. Everybody messes up. It's okay to mess up because mm-hmm. how do you learn by messing up? Exactly. There's another variable to that too. There's also instructors who maybe do things a certain way because it works better for them. And I'll bring this up as an example. Um, during this jujitsu ju- ju- test, uh, there was another instructor that they knew who uh, rotates on his heels. And they're like, you're mm-hmm. not supposed to do that. Like, like the balance is not there, but... This for this one guy, it works for him. He makes it strong. He makes his the techniques work, but biomechanically, it doesn't work for most people. And like, right. generally, rotate on, on your on your heels, you don't have the stability to balance. But he does. And yeah. there could be exceptions out there where instructor might do something a specific way because they made it work for them specifically, even though it might mm-hmm. be technically 
and anatomically incorrect. If they get it to work, it's valid for them, but then they need to be upfront about that. Hey, this is the way I'm going to do it. I don't want you guys to do it this way, but this is the way it works for me. I think that's another way to approach it, honestly, but th I think that needs to be clarified so that yeah. students understand, oh, well, that's not the way I'm supposed to do it. So if this guy had told me, well, you're right, it should be here, but this is the way I do it for this reason, I'd be a little bit more inclined to be like, all right, but you should say something then about it. But sometimes sometimes people can modify techniques that might not be correct, but it mm -hmm. works better for them that way. Yep. And and that's I think that's the beauty as you get into upper ranks is starting to compare those really fine details of, OK, you do this this way. I do this. You do this this way. Um, we've talked about on the show before. You've, you've probably seen it. Uh, examples of different styles doing the same form in real mm -hmm. time. And you can watch and go, oh, oh. And I, I find that fascinating. And it doesn't just mm -hmm. have to be forms. It can be any technique. That's how you do a front kick. That's how you do a front kick. Oh, this is how you do this entry. Oh, that's really cool because it's it's nuanced. And once you've been training for decades, all you really have left is nuance. Mm -hmm. That's really good stuff as far as I'm concerned. I, I love seeing that. Oh, oh, comparing stuff because you're nobody does it exactly the same way. No one does anything exactly the same way. So those differences. Even in the same school with the same instruction and straight, same exactly. curriculum because we're all built just a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And psychologically too, motivation is always different too. So yeah, I love that's where all the juicy details are. Totally agree. Just, so. So what's coming? What's what's next? If we were to sync back up in five years or so, you know, what do you think you'd be telling me about your training? It's a good question. Well, hopefully by then I figured out my own curriculum. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still working <laughs> on that. Because one of the problems I have is I've started, even now I'm still starting over. Like I, I, I'll i review my first few belt levels and I'll go and study those techniques. And then, you know, I'll do these classes with, with, with Mr. Alex and, and his instructor. And I stop, I'm like, Okay, so I take the information and I keep going back to the white belt material. And like one day I'll get past like the yellow orange belt again. I've been doing those same techniques for years, but I'm hoping to get to the point where I, I finally see the core fundamental aspects of it where I can apply it throughout the whole system. So five years from now, hopefully I've, I'm finally where I want to be with Kempo again. Um, I'm hope, hopefully uh, proficient with judo and hopefully uh, I'd like to throw in another art. I'm not sure what that would be yet. Um, I kind of mm -hmm. like the idea of Muay Thai, a little bit of boxing. Um, maybe another traditional karate style. I'm kind of keeping my eye out, but hopefully in five years, I'm engaged in the third art, like at least to some degree and just trying to mold my own training even more. Cause I try to look, see where, where I, I feel weak. Cause like the reason I went to judo jujitsu was, well, I don't, well, Campbell doesn't have the throws I've always wanted to learn. And there's not really much ground stuff. Now speaking of five O did ground material. So that's really more BJJ. So that's, that's really cool stuff. I did that a little bit, but I really want to do stand up. So that's why I went to that. Um, I thought I think boxing is great for I think boxing supplements pretty much anything. It's a fantastic striking art. I don't think mm. there's really much out there better than boxing to learn striking. So I wouldn't mind actually doing some formal boxing. Muay Thai mm. would be good for some some conditioning kicks and like so this is, I'm I'm trying to trying to see uh, maybe Krav Maga like a really really good school for weapons defense. Um, so I'm I'm hoping five years from now I've I've got another art or two that I'm I'm actively training in. Uh, I hope the channel has expanded more. Like, there's so much more I want to explore. There's so much more history we want to get into. Cool. Uh, we want to start visiting schools. I think we, we, I mean, we're in an area where um, Palm Beach, Broward County, and Dade County, there are tons of martial so arts schools. Many schools. Yeah. So and many some varieties. Very, very good martial arts. Now. Yes. And but the, but the just the it's a mixing pot. It's not like it's like it's not like it's a hundred karate schools. There is kung fu, karate. There's Indian everything. arts. Everything's here. So yeah, I think we have the opportunity to go and start visiting schools. We were going to do it. We we were planning in 2020. We were going to call it Day in the Art. And I had started contacting schools. Then the pandemic hit and everything shut down. I'm like, all right, we're not visiting schools for a while. Um, but that's something we want to get back to. So we're trying to kind of pick that back up. Hopefully sooner oh, cool. rather than later. And we're also trying to, you know, we're just launched our own new website. We're trying to get a blog going. Hopefully, eventually, plug podcast. all this stuff. Make make sure everybody knows where to find this stuff. Um, Artofonedojo.com. We just launched it. We've got um, t-shirts up there. We just uh, released our forefather t-shirts. So okay. uh, we've got twelve of them. So it's like Choji Miyagi, uh, Jigoro Kano. So basically, the whole idea was we took a uh, a public domain old photo of them. My wife upresed it and re re enhanced it and restored it. And we made a portrait out of it with a, with a quote. We're trying to we're trying to honor oh, these I guys because there's so much history. I mean these these men have put so much foundational material down mm. where martial arts have built off of. You know we wanted to honor them and 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 kind of give back with that. So we have twelve of those shirts up now, 
And hopefully throughout this year, we're going to add a bunch more. We want to add rash guards of different styles. We want to do bags. So basically we have, you know, we're trying to support the channel, get mm-hmm. be a little bit more self-sufficient. So we have our store up. We're going to work on a blog. We're going to work on a podcast eventually, possibly a spinoff channel. We're still kind of working out details on that. So we doing this project. I love, I love the more I do it, the more I love it. The more I learn, the mm-hmm. more I want to learn more. So hopefully we can just keep branching out and make it more of a bigger interactive community, you know, get more of an online chat message board going, just try to get as many people from different arts as possible in one discussion and to one plane where we can talk constructively like, okay, well I do this, but I appreciate what you do because of X, Y, Z. It's not what I'm going to mm-hmm. do, but I like that you, you know, your approach and, just try to get pe- just try to get people away from the toxic. Well, that's never going to work in the ring. I hate I hate that response. Oh, it'll never work in this situation. Well, how do you know it'll never work? It might not, maybe it won't work for you. <laughs> it worked I, I for did, somebody did, somewhere. <laughs> I got so sick of that. I did. I I think I only posted this on on TikTok. I said, all right, if that's your lens under the world, you know what technique works the most and still doesn't even work close to fifty percent? A jab. It's the most reliable <laughs> technique anybody has in any combat sport, and it doesn't work most of the time. Yeah. You need a new standard to determine what you should be working on in that. Mm-hmm. And I love the answer, too. People will be like, oh, uh, how come if that's so good, how come if there's like Taekwondo so good, how come I never see it in MMA? I'm like, why don't you see Cause, it? Because you're, you're not looking because it's all looking. over the place. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what to look for? You know, it's like it's not just because, you know, person's not going to break out a, a, a uh, curriculum sequence all the time, but there's principles in there. There's parts of it they're going to use stances, transitions. Look at Leona Machida. He uses Shotokan all the time in the ring. So yes, karate is an MMA all the time. These people have their mix from something. It's there if you look for it. Yep. But they're doing the same thing. They're taking their this toolbox and they're taking. Well, I want these three tools, and that's what they're doing because this is the purpose they're using it for. Yep. And but how good would those three tools have been if they hadn't had? all of the other tools that help them refine them into what they are. Because as we already talked about, we'll we'll start to wind down as we bring it full circle. It's all about the nuance and everybody does it a little bit differently, but though their unique experiences and all their training are what got them to those three things that they're now known for and can pull out whenever they need. Absolutely. Everyone's got their own experience. Everyone's got their own reasons. It's just, it's really just a matter of finding you have to identify what you want. What do you want to get out of the martial arts? Do you want to be a fighter? Do you want to be a com- competitor? Do you want to do you want to yeah. learn how to walk again? What is your goal? And find an art that that works towards that goal specifically. There's people I know who trained because literally they had brain injuries and they just couldn't walk anymore and they wanted to do something and that martial art got them to do it. It worked. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, they, okay, maybe they didn't go into a fight, but they saved themselves with it. So there's always value somewhere. So find that value and line it up with what your motivation is, and then you'll be fine. Totally agree. So as we wind down here, you know, we'll make sure that we we link your stuff in the show notes. Really appreciate you coming on. But Thank this is so where much. I give you the the opportunity to, to say goodbye. Sounds final, but I, I guess in a sense it is. How do you how do you want to close out? What words do you want to leave the audience with today? I'm I will leave with what I'm trying to do more of myself is don't let the small things bother you. People are going to say what they're going to say. Um, There's so much bad out there. There's so many people who are negative and focus on the wrong things of the arts. Don't waste your energy on that. Just if you're going to put energy at all into training, just look for stuff that makes you feel good. That makes you happy. And that, like I said, and that matches your goals, you're training for a very specific reason, or you're researching for a very specific reason. Don't let others negativity derail you from that because you don't know where they're coming from either. They might have had a bad experience or went to a bad school or, or they might have some even valid reasons, but their reasons don't have to be your reasons. So I would say, and it's hard because running a YouTube channel, there's negativity. I mean, there's the comments sometimes that come in, you know, there's days you get yeah. a comment and it, it ruins your day. And, yeah. but, um, you got to learn to, if, to if, un- you, if you feel, I'm, I'm going to jump. No. Yeah. If you feel really, if you feel really good about yourself and humanity and the world, go read some YouTube comments. It'll bring you back down a notch. <laughs> exactly. And I, I, I want to say now, I, I, now on that note, I do have to say, I am actually very thankful for our YouTube audience. We have a pretty, pretty good audience. Like, I mean, that's great. I would say 99% of the comments are constructive and honest and upfront. We get the nasty ones, but compared to what I've seen on a lot of other channels, I, I consider ourselves very, very lucky that we've got a very 
I want to say pure group, like people who are actually invested in the in the in the content. So I'm very very thankful for that. But there That's are right. negative people out there. I've had people out there who tried to tell me what my own experience was. I'm like, okay, you can argue an art doesn't work, but you can't tell me that I didn't know someone or that I didn't do this. You don't you can't tell me my life experience or people who just want to get a nasty jab in there and say some horrible things. But you you gotta. And that's something I've had to learn doing the channel is you can't let other people derail you from what you're doing when they're coming from their own negativity. Cause then you got to ask, well, where are they come? Why do they feel the way they do? Cause their experience is probably very, very different than yours. So find that goal and then find whatever art or whatever method you feel is appropriate towards that goal. And don't let others derail you from that because they're just another obstacle. You know, you're training for self-defense. You're training to make yourself stronger. Well, that's an exercise right there is that's an element to defend yourself against is that negativity. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I really felt like this was someone that I could relate to. Not because of the starting over, although I have started over quite a few times, but the relationship to the martial arts and, and the recognition that it just kind of has to be there in some way. It's not always going to be fully intense. It's not always going to be distant, but there will always be a relationship for me with martial arts and that was something that dan talked about that i i dug i related to i hope you found some things in this episode that you also related to now if you love what we do if you want to support what we do remember all the things you can do you can do things as free and easy as following us and checking out the things that we make you can also tell people about the things that we do you can join the patreon but you could also consider helping us reach martial arts schools via our consulting work. We have a 100% success rate with helping martial arts schools grow in ways that exceed the financial commitment they have made to us. 100% of the time we've done this, we have succeeded. So if we look at things in that way, if you have a school, why would you not want to talk to us? I lead this team of consultants but I am not the only one. There are a bunch of people who help out in various ways. And I'm not going to let that 100% number drop. I will promise you, we will help your school reach the goals that you have, whether they're financial, whether they're student count, whether they're improving culture. There are so many things that you might want to improve in the school that you run or own. Reach out. Go to whistlekick.com. Go to the school tab. You'll see other things that we do for schools. But you can sign up for a free call. I'll give you an hour. And we'll chat and we'll see if it's a fit. It's not always a fit because sometimes people don't want to do the work. It's not something we can do on our own. We do it in collaboration and we do it with respect and integrity to what is important to you. But assuming that we cross that hurdle, which 90, the vast majority of schools do, I can promise you we can help you out. Why would you not? Why would you not talk to me? If you want to talk to me in other ways, you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Maybe you want to have me into your school. Maybe you want to have me come teach a seminar. Maybe you want me to bring some of the other folks in the Whistlekick family with me. Maybe you want to, me to bring Andrew and we'll co-teach a seminar. These are things that we can and do do. And it's fun stuff. Don't forget the Patreon. Don't forget to share episodes. I don't know. I'm winding up. I thank you for coming by. Thank you for all of your support. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.